The deposition makes for interesting reading. One of the things that local magistrates send into the Home Office are documents like this, depositions that they've taken from people who've witnessed the Luddite attack, from, in some cases, of course, Luddites who've decided to turn King's evidence and incriminate their co-conspirators as a way of getting themselves off. So you've got to be on your guard, of course, you know, how much of what's being said here is what the magistrate and the Home Office wants to hear, etc. But nonetheless, you get quite a lot of detail. You've got the deposition here of George Jeffrey and on the other page, Robert Hodges, two people who witnessed a Luddite raid at Sutton in Ashfield in the early phase of Luddism. It's actually from November 1811. It's probably worth us just going through, actually, because I think it pulls out a number of themes. George Jeffrey of Hucknall Talkers say that hearing a great number of persons at Hucknall Talkers were going to break frames at Mansfield and Sutton in Ashfield, he went with them and was accompanied with Joseph Butler, George Rhodes, son of William Rhodes of Hucknall aforesaid, Joseph Brackney, apprentice with the examinant, that his master knew of his going and was asked by Joseph Beck and Joseph Kettledon to go with him. And Buck told his master that if he did not go with them or give them money, he would break his frames. We know that there was quite a bit of impressment going on in the villages of Luddites trying to twist the arm of other frame witnesses to join in their depredations and also extorting money from other members of the community as well. One of the things that really exercises the Lord Lieutenant and the Magistrates is that the Luddites, in their view, are supporting themselves by essentially levying money from the rest of the community, often at gunpoint, which there's some evidence for. Again, to look at this in the context of festive culture, there is a very well-developed tradition in English culture of workers, particularly at times of feasts, of going round and levying contributions from the community, often with blackened faces, as many of these Luddites themselves did. So it wouldn't have been an unusual occurrence for, say, farmers to be forced to give over money to support those who, for the most of the time, are doing backbreaking labour for the benefit of the farmer. And he saw his master give Beck some money, but can't say how much, but thinks it was a shilling. That on his road from Hucknall to Sutton, he saw Benjamin Checker, Benjamin Hancock, in fact, Henry Richards and Joseph Hutchinson with guns. And that he went along with the crowd to Sutton and went through Kirby. That in passing through Kirby, Checker and others knocked at the door of a house there and told the persons within that if they did not bring out their guns, they would break the door. That a man and two women came to the door and the wife brought out the gun and gave it to Checker, and then Checker gave the gun, which he before had in his possession, to Fell, and told him it was charged, and he said Checker charged the gun he had received at Kirby. Then they proceeded towards Sutton, and he heard Matthew Lim of Hucknall tell Lowe of Hucknall that he expected there to be about a hundred frames of Sutton, and they would break them all. The soldiers fired on them, they would fire again. That at the road from the street to Sutton, he saw Checker and another man fire a gun each. And Checker said the best gunman, hatchet men and hammer men must go first. One of the things that, again, really alarms the authorities is just how organised these Luddite raids are. You'll see the deponent actually goes on to use the word mob in a moment, but certainly the later Luddite attacks were anything but mob-like. They were carried out by deeply disciplined, almost militarily drilled men. And you get a sense of the organisation here just from the different types of men involved in this attack. There were gunmen, there were hatchet, and there were hammermen. Now, you've already got an indication of what the gunmen have been used for. That's partly a nice threatening weapon. It's been used to extort money from the rest of the community. The hatchet men. Now, why would you need men with hatchets? You might need those to actually break down the door and possibly break the wooden frames of the, uh, the knitting frames. But the ones who delivered the fatal blow, as it were, were the hammermen. Of course, the knitting frames are essentially composed of both wood and metal. So you need implements that are going to be effective against both of those different materials. That when they arrived in Sutton, this examiner went with the mob to Francis Betts house and he saw frames thrown out of the window at Betts's house and persons in the street breaking them to pieces. And he saw Benjamin Checker come out of there 
uh, and a person they call Janet, I think, who lives at Charles uh, Thorpe's at Hucknall in Betz's house, with his face blackened and a bottle in his hand, out of which he was drinking, and which he afterwards broke. But whilst the mob was breaking frames in the street, Fell stood by uh, with a gun. He also saw on the outside of Betz's house, Dash Leg, who lives at Widdison's building in Hucknall. John Hayes of Hucknall, and works at one of William Robinson's cotton mills. That's interesting. There are a very small number of cotton mills in Nottinghamshire at this time, but there are not very many of them. And in fact, there are less than there used to be at this stage, because the reactions of the local communities have been so hostile to the idea of factory-based production that famously, of course, the entrepreneurs have been driven further north. And that's one reason why you see more cotton factory production based in Lancashire rather than in Nottinghamshire. But there are a small number of them. And you have got some, admittedly, cursory evidence there that Luddites are gaining support not just from framework knitters, but people who are also work in factories as well, whose name he thinks is Henson. I don't think it's Greg Henson. And lives in Widdison's building. So you can see here you've got two people on this attack who live in the same place. Luddite connections are forged partly through neighbourhood ones as well as through trading connections. We also know that a number of frame-breaking episodes were accompanied by stealing as well. Got a small misdemeanor there, a bottle of alcohol seems to have been stolen and one of the knitters is helping themselves to it. There are a number of instances where frame-breaking is accompanied by theft or those who were involved in frame-breaking on one occasion were perhaps caught and convicted for stealing on another. Here you can see something I found, I think, in the Central Library. One of the handbills that was issued after the Assizes had sat, listing all the people who'd been tried and convicted, some of which are for frame-breaking. Top one, Joseph Falconbridge, age 30, charged on the oath of Robert Gaunt, for that he, the Sir Joseph Falconbridge, on the 13th day of November, blah, 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 did felonsy and willingly break and destroy a certain stocking frame, the property of John Ward. But if you look down here, you can see that these charges for frame-breaking also involve other framework knitters for other crimes. Here you've got Thomas Revel, charged upon his own confession with having in company with Benjamin Renshaw at Manfield, a foresaid framework knitter, on a Saturday in the evening in the summer of the year 110, felonously stolen, taken and carried away from a close situate in the parish of Mansfield, one Ramshi property of Isaac Dodsley. Why am I telling you this? One argument traditionally put forward is that Luddites were very skilled craftsmen, the most skilled and respected framework knitters in the community. They were the ones, of course, who felt most threatened by the introduction of cheaper methods of production. So some at Malcolm Thomas in particular has said that Luddism really is not so much a movement of working class consciousness. It's actually about skilled framework knitters against unskilled framework knitters, because the unskilled framework knitters are the ones who are doing the cheap shoddy work. How do you stop your brethren from making cheap mass shoddy goods? Well, the only way you've got really is to destroy the machinery that they operate. I'm not entirely convinced by that, partly because if you look at all these different kinds of pieces of evidence, it's very clear that framework knitting and framework knitters generally at this time are anything but respectable. It's a hard job, it's not a very pleasant job, and not surprisingly, it's accompanied by all sorts of what you might call a kind of rough culture of various crimes. One thing I've done, I've gone through the court records for the ten years preceding thereabouts, Luddism, which are held in Nottinghamshire archives, and I've recorded all the instances where framework knitters were convicted and or indicted. And you can see here, again, it just brings out the kind of rural context of these Luddites, that 39 Luddites who were convicted, 28% of them uh, were convicted for poaching offences. Some of you may know that it's actually the capture of a group of poachers on Middleton's estate in 1816 that leads to the police finally closing in and capturing James Tull, who was the Luddite who famously led the attack on 
Heathcote's mill at Loughborough was actually him and a group of others who were convicted for poaching that led one of them, John Blackburn, to turn King's evidence as a way of trying to save his own skin by implicating all of these Luddites. And what becomes clear from other evidence is that those who broke frames were also involved in other criminal activities. Another piece of evidence that came to light in the mid-80s, which is now deposited in Nottingham City Archives, is an autobiography of a framework knitter who claimed to have known James Toll and those who were the leaders of the Luddite gang. And what you get in that, of course, is evidence about Luddite attacks interspersed with everything else that these knitters got up to. And one of the things they got up to regularly was poaching. Why? Not surprisingly, poaching is often seen as a, what's called a social crime. These knitters were struggling to make ends meet. There's an enormous amount of game around. There's also, of course, a lot of money to be made from selling game on the black market. So it's not surprising that they were engaged in some of those kinds of protest crimes, survival crimes. It's partly survival. I think it's also partly evidence of the beef that the knitters have got not just with their masters who employ them as framework knitters, but also with the local landowners. I don't think it's a coincidence, and let me get my figures right on this, that in a number of the villages that were epicentres of Luddism, they had recently been enclosed. There's a whole spate of parliamentary legislation in the 1790s and the first decade of the 1800s, where a number of these parishes were enclosed. In some cases, not for the first time. Often, when we talk about somewhere being enclosed, the traditional idea of land that was held in common and used for grazing, perhaps growing some vegetables, when that is taken away, it usually takes several acts of Parliament, often over a long period of time, for that enclosure to fully take effect. And it's in the 1790s and 1800s that you, you see some of the final acts of enclosure taking place. So, what's the significance of that? Well, I haven't got too far into this just yet, but we know, of course, that common land was essential for those who didn't earn very high wages. They had to have other means of making ends meet, perhaps by grazing animals, perhaps by growing their own crops. Now, if areas are being enclosed and those rights are being taken away, then that puts even more and more pressure on the knitters. And again, it's not a coincidence you see the result into poaching. Again, if you, other evidence, it's a rough culture. 23% of these are for fights, fisticuffs, that are regular affairs in the framework knitting villages. You can also see they're quite a riotous bunch, and there's also a bit of stealing going on as well. So I haven't sort of got into details about just how far these enclosures took common land away that knitters, the knitters may have had. To do that, I need to get into the estate papers. Baseford, of course, places like that, are still largely owned by the Duke of Newcastle, uh, Chesterfield, at the time of the knitters. So what I want to see is whether enclosure really was stripping away popular rights that had been held for hundreds of years, and if so, is that another sort of dimension to Luddism as well? It's not just the masters, they're, they're the hosiest they see as their enemies, but also the landed classes as well. 